Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Imagine the abject fear a parent would experience after their 11-year-old child has been missing for over three weeks. No one has heard from her. No one has seen her. You'd be climbing the walls, right? Begging investigators and the public to help find her. Well, that's what usually happens, but not in the case of Madalena Kojakari. Madalena went to school as normal on November 21st, 2022, but she didn't show up the next day. Or the day after that. Eventually, on December 12th, a school resource officer from Bailey Middle School attempted a home visit and left a truancy packet. It wouldn't be until December 15th, over three weeks since her daughter was last seen, that her mother, Diana Kojakari, admitted to school officials that she didn't know where Madalena was. The Cornelius, North Carolina community has been frantically trying to find the missing little girl while her parents sit in jail. Months have gone by, but no one is answering the question, where is Madalena Kojakari? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Madalena Kojakari. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flake. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone welcome back thank you so much for joining us once again we have ethan back with us this week hello (laughs) we are back to uh normal this week so this story is really upsetting and unfortunately echoes ones that we've heard before like those of oakley carlson and harmony montgomery a child is in the care of her custodial parents she disappears and they fail to report her missing in a timely manner But this one definitely takes a twist that the others don't. So this case was suggested to us by our listener, Kelly. Um, She used our new case suggestion form that I have put in our show notes. Mm. And and I decided that it would be a good one to cover, even though it's so recent, because after looking into it more, because I've been following it from the beginning, but like I was unaware of the most recent developments in it. And so this definitely does seem like one that needs to get out there more and kind of needs more eyes and ears on it um, in hopes of getting more information, because I think this one is one that we will get answers to. But yeah, I mean, do you remember this? Because this is in Cornelius and yeah, it happened. I, re- I remember seeing the wanted posters when we were there. Yeah, not exactly. The, wanted, the missing posters when we were there. Yeah, exactly. Because this is, we were in Cornelius right after this happened. So we were there like a week and a half after she was reported missing. So it was obviously huge news down there. That's what we're talking about today. Um, It'll be a a bit of a shorter episode probably, again, because it is so new, but I do think it's important. But before we get started, we have a few new people over on Patreon. So we want to say thank you so much to Shana D, Jody C, Andrea R, and Nicola B. We really appreciate your support. Thank you all so, so much. If you'd like to get in on the action and join at any level, you'll not only get these episodes early and ad-free, but you'll get your own copy of the And Then They Were Gone ebook. But now let's get into the story of Madalena Kojakari. Madalena Kojakari was born on April 11th, 2011 to Diana Kojakari in Moldova. Um, Moldova. Spain. (laughs) No, 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 no. Moldova is its own country. It's Eastern European. It's bordered by Ukraine and Romania. Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I don't know, unfortunately, a ton of biographical information about Madalena, including who her biological father is. I do know that Diana was married at one point, but from what I've read, and this is unconfirmed, it seems as though Madalena wasn't born during that marriage, she was born from a relationship after that marriage ended, but she was born in Moldova. What is clear is that Diana was looking to change her life after her daughter was born in, in a variety of ways. People actually d- dug up 
clips from a Moldovan weight loss reality show that Diana went on. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's all in Romanian. And so I, you know, but I've looked, I've watched a couple of the clips and it's like, you know, the typical B roll of like, you know, telling the story or whatever. And it shows Diana and Madalena, who's like, two years old at the time, uh, playing in a park together and, you know, doing stuff like that. After that, uh, Diana set her sights on America. I don't know exactly when, but at some point, she met mechanical designer Christopher Palmiter online. Though he was 22 years her senior, they married and Diana and Madalena set off for a new life in the States. 22 years. Yeah. So actually almost 23 now. So I think at the moment he's 60 and she's 38. Wow. The new family settled in Cornelius, North Carolina, a suburb of Charlotte. Cornelius is a beautiful, well-kept, like upper middle class, I would say, town. And it's home to executives and retired athletes who are drawn to its proximity to Charlotte and the boating offered by the nearby lakes, including Lake Norman and Lake Cornelius. Accounts of Diana and Christopher's relationship differs depending on what side you speak to. His friends paint her as a, you know, manipulative and jealous woman who was jealous of everything that Christopher does for her daughter. Diana's family, who remains in Moldova, says that Diana and Madalena seemed happy with their new life, but they also said that Christopher was controlling and didn't like for Diana to speak to her family. Her father said that she would mostly call when Christopher wasn't around. Yeah, that's that's not a good sign. No. What is certain is that by the end of 2022, the couple was not in a good place. They frequently argued, and these arguments directly led to what happened to Madalena. The question is, in what way? All right. Now, this is the timeline, and I'm going to warn you up front that it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) <laughs> okay like completely you're gonna have a hundred questions okay so i'm gonna lay it out though so we'll just go over the whole thing and then we'll just discuss it all so hold my questions hold your questions end. to the end okay. because it's 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 ridiculous november 21st 2022 madalena is seen by her school bus's surveillance camera exiting the bus at her usual stop after school One of her neighbors, who is also on the bus and goes to Bailey Middle School, reports that he walked behind her after they got off the bus and saw her enter her house as usual. November 23rd, two days later, Diana and Christopher get into an argument that evening. During the argument, at around 10 p.m., Madalena goes to bed. Christopher decides to drive up to Michigan, where he's originally from, to, quote, pick up items, end quote. And just for those uh, of you who are not familiar with the geography of this, North Carolina to Michigan is about 800 miles uh, away. And it's like a 13-hour drive if you drive straight through with no brakes and no traffic. So we're not talking a quick little jaunt to pick up, you know, some old yearbooks that might be at your mom's house. November 24th, so the next day, Around 11.30 a.m., Diana goes into Madalena's room to check on her, but she's gone. Now, I read one report that said Diana woke up feeling disoriented, like she had just woken up from general anesthesia. So that could explain why she didn't go and check on her 11-year-old daughter until 11.30 in the morning, but it doesn't explain any of the other million questions you probably have right now. November 26th, 2022. So another two days, Christopher returns home from Michigan. And now I find that really interesting because again, like we're talking a 13 hour drive and he's gone for, he leaves after 10 PM on November 23rd and makes it back on the 26th. So that is like enough time to drive like through all night, pick up whatever you wanted to pick up, maybe take a nap and then drive back. I mean, it doesn't really give you much time to do anything else. 
I have so many questions, though. <laughs> I know, right? On the 26th, Christopher returns home from Michigan. Diana asks him if he knows where Madalena is. He says he doesn't. He asks her if she knows where Madalena is. She says she doesn't. She asks him if he's hiding her. He says he isn't. He asks her if she's hiding her. She says she isn't. Okay. Yeah. Now we fast forward to December 12th. So we're talking a full on almost three weeks later. Bailey Middle School's school resource officer. And uh, again, for people who are not in the States and not living in our dystopian nightmare world here, um, you might not know what a school resource officer is. It's a police officer who is stationed in our schools because our schools have armed police police officers in them. This particular school resource officer, as they call them, and sixth grade counselor visit Madalena's home. They knock, but no one answers the door. Mm. So they leave a truancy pack packet. So basically, if you don't show up for school for a long time, you're considered truant, and you know that can trigger legal proceedings. Right. So this is like the first step in that, basically. December 14th, 2022, two days later, Diana calls the counselor and requests a meeting regarding Madalena's truancy. A meeting is scheduled for the next day with Diana and Madalena. So Diana says on the phone that she is going to come into the school the next day and bring her daughter with her. Okay. So the next day, December 15th comes and Diana arrives at the school without Madalena. She tells the counselor that she hasn't seen her daughter since November 23rd. The counselor calls in the school resource officer and they ask Diana why she hasn't reported Madalena missing to the police. She tells them that she didn't want to start a, quote, conflict between her and her husband. Uh, (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah. She didn't want to fight with her husband, so she just said, "Uh, oh, well, my kid's missing. I guess. So then they called Christopher in because they're like, okay, well, obviously we need to talk to this husband slash stepfather. Mm hmm. And he tells them, like, oh, yeah, I went to Michigan on the 23rd, and I got back the 26th, and when I get back, she's like, oh, I don't know where Madalena is. And this is what's crazy. I mean, all of it, but this is what's even crazier. He also tells them that despite the fact that he and Madalena both live in the same house, like, you know, the marriage, like, they weren't separated, you know, nothing like yeah. that, despite this... He says that he hadn't seen Madalena for a week prior to leaving for Michigan. He says he hasn't seen her since like the 15th or the 16th of November. But But we know she was there. Like we, yeah, we we have video video proof from the 21st. So like, why even say that? Like, that just makes everything look more suspicious. Yeah. Because we know she was fine on the 21st. But he's saying he didn't see her for like five days prior to that. And he was in the house because they got into the argument in the house on the 23rd. So am I allowed to ask questions yet? Uh, Almost. (laughs) So at this point, Madalena is reported missing to Cornelia's police. Investigators immediately secure a search warrant for the home. 25 items are seized, but all except for three iPhones are redacted. Over the past couple months, there's been a lot of back and forth with um, the documents in this case. The court ruled back in December, I believe, that that they were going to seal all of the warrants and the inventory and everything because they were afraid that releasing that publicly would interfere with Diana and Christopher receiving a fair trial because this case has been so high profile locally. But then in January, there was a challenge to that in court. And so the documents have been released, but with certain information redacted. Mm -hmm. So we have the search warrants. But like I said, in terms of the inventory list of what was seized, we can see that it's numbered one through 25. But, but we don't know what it is. Exactly. Everything except for three iPhones um, is redacted. December 16th, 2022, 
Cornelius police ask the FBI to assist in the case. They also acquire a warrant for everybody's phone records. Now, Madalena did not have a phone herself. It seems as though Christopher maybe had two phones. Diana had one, or maybe Diana had two phones. Christopher, there, but there are three phones between the adults. I also do want to say that, like Cornelius police, as soon as they were aware of this, really took it seriously and really got on on the ball. December seventeenth, twenty twenty two. Both Diana and Christopher are arrested and charged with failure to report the disappearance of a child to law enforcement. December twenty first, twenty twenty two. A search warrant is executed at the family's home. A few more items are seized. Actually, I'm going to take a pause here and let's just because the rest of the timeline kind of deals more with like the investigation and what's going on now. So let's take a break and just talk about like what on earth is the story that they're giving. Yeah. Can I ask questions? Yes. Now you can. Okay. So we have the video evidence of her going into her house and then you said well no so the video video evidence evidence is only of her getting off the bus and so that was one of the questions was did she actually make it home that day but we have Um, a witness that says that she did yes one of the neighbors okay so then you said two days later is when they got into an argument correct so where are you getting that information from from diana so that's the story that she told the counselor and the school resource officer. But what I find interesting and confusing, you know, number one is that the 21st, the day that she was last seen, that Madalena was last seen is a Monday. Okay. Yeah. The 22nd is is a Tuesday. She should have been in school. Right. And the 23rd, the Wednesday was also a school day. Um, And then school was closed for Thanksgiving Thursday and Friday, and maybe Monday. I'm not sure about Monday, but at the very least, Thursday and Friday. So she, meaning Madalena, should have been in school Uh the 22nd and the 23rd as well, and was not. So much to unpack here. And apparently, and and this is what I haven't seen confirmed, because like the story of the fight on the 23rd and, and all of that stuff, like I said, that is the story that she gave to the school officials. And we are getting that information from the probable cause affidavit for their arrest and for the search warrant. So we're getting that directly from the police. What we're not getting is like, did they ask the question of like, what about the 22nd? Like, where was she? Why didn't she go to school on the 22nd? Yeah, and well, so like, that's I mean, not a part of it. Right. I, I'm sure that would be in the transcripts of the interview, but right. like they they can't release that to the public at this point. So yes, we only have kind of the, the, the basics of whatever she may have told them and, you know, whatever questions may have been asked. But like that's red flag number one. And then, like I said, so what's not in the probable cause affidavit, and that's why I hesitate to like, you know, say that this is confirmed because it's not, is that apparently she originally said that the fight was was on the 22nd, but that when Christopher came, he said it was the 23rd. And so she was like, oh, yeah, it was the 23rd. Like she changed her story to match his. But that, again, is not laid out specifically in the affidavit. So I, I can't swear to that. Did she say anything about what the fight was about? Not that's been published, no. And do we have any knowledge that Madalena was a point of contention in their relationship before this? Not at all. And her Diana's family doesn't say that specifically. Like I said, Christopher's friends or whatever say that, you know, he doted on her. So who knows? But that wasn't like a a known fact prior to this, you know? Yeah, I mean, the reason why I'm asking that is because it seems to me, given the timeline and how weird it is, that maybe something happened to Madalena and then they came up with a plan to dispose of her body or whatever Mm -hmm. that involved him driving up to Michigan and they came up with this stupid alibi with like, them getting into a fight and him going to pick things up from Michigan. Yeah. But like, even that doesn't make sense. Right. Because it's like, yeah, none of this makes sense. Even if that's the case, 
the fact that they didn't report it to anybody makes it look a billion times yeah. worse. Yeah. You know, it's so strange to me because other than saying, yeah, we got into a fight and, you know, he went to Michigan, like it didn't really seem like they were on the same page with what had happened. I mean, he's claiming he hadn't seen Madalena for a week prior to that, even though they were in the same house together. Like, how does that even work? Yeah. I mean, you know, like it doesn't seem to me as though they were like a hundred percent working together on this. Yeah. It's also in any way, you know? Yeah. It's also interesting to note that she mentioned um, that she felt like she had been drugged. Yes. So is that like, kind of her way of sliding in a possible way to get out of the situation. Right. Like maybe she's implying that he drugged her and then, and then did something to Madalena. Yeah. And she was too scared to report her missing. And that's why she asked him if he had her or if he was hiding her, mm -hmm. you know, like that again, that makes sense to me. Like I could get behind that. If it weren't for the fact that after he got back on the 26th, neither one of them said anything to anybody. Right. You know? Maybe if he's abusive. Yeah. Um, you know, she was in fear of reporting uh, her daughter missing because of what retribution might come. Right. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, none of this makes sense. No. And and yes, and that's, of course, a theory that's been bandied about a lot, right? right. Is that she was in fear um, of him, and that's why she didn't report anything. But we'll talk about that more later as we kind of get more into the timeline from between December and now. I can believe it to an extent. Basically, it makes less sense every single day that passes. But so we'll get back to that. But all right. So are we ready to to yeah. continue with the timeline? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So where we left off, uh, Diana and Christopher were arrested um, on the seventeenth. The a second search warrant is executed at the family's home on December twenty first, and a few more items were seized. So reporters were there, and they saw a detective or, you know, whoever bring out basically like a box full of stuff and the inventory, which is completely redacted on that one is only three or four items. I believe on December 27th, 2022 Cornelius police release a statement. Good afternoon. I'm captain Jennifer Thompson of the Cornelius police department. First on behalf of our command staff, our town manager and elected officials, I want to say thank you to all the agencies who are assisting us in our search for Madalena. Over the past 12 days, the Cornelius Police Department has led a massive investigation to find 11-year-old Madalena Kojikari. One of the challenges in this case, simply put, we were not notified she was gone, a delay of three weeks. School officials had repeatedly tried to contact Madalena's parents, Finally, on December 15th, Madalena's mother walked into school and said her daughter was missing. We immediately called in partners from across the state and from the FBI. Since that Thursday, nearly two weeks ago, hundreds of agents, detectives, analysts, and other employees surged. In cooperation with the district attorney's office, we arrested Madalena's mother, Diana Kojikari, and her stepfather, Christopher Palmiter. Thankfully, the state of North Carolina has a law that makes it illegal if someone fails to report a missing child to law enforcement. Here are some of the specifics. Investigators have developed and followed nearly 250 leads spanning across state lines and across the globe. We have interviewed hundreds of people in North Carolina and other states and again across the globe. We went door to door to at least 245 homes focusing on the Victoria Bay community where Madalena lives. We canvassed businesses and scoured through hours of surveillance video from all over the area. We also led land and water searches around Lake Cornelius as a precautionary measure. Investigators obtained multiple search warrant for Madalena's home to make sure we legally gathered each and every possible piece of evidence to find Madalena. We know everyone has a lot of questions. We also have questions and are doing everything we can with proper legal authority to get those answers. We know you understand us sharing investigative details could harm our efforts in finding Madalena. The Corneas Police Department is so grateful for the tremendous outpouring of support. 
This is a serious case of a child whose parents clearly are not telling us everything they know. Please call us if you have eyewitness information. Thank you for your time and efforts to help us find Madalena. So I wanted to play that um, just to reiterate kind of what had been done in the investigation and show that again, because we talk a lot of shit about cops, uh, rightfully so. I I have no regrets, but um, you know, Cornelius police, like really, like I said, seems to be on the ball here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that definitely shows that, you know, they're working this case as hard as they can, but uh, that statement also really doesn't say anything right. other, other than that. Yeah. And, but, you know, it does talk about, you know, the, the interviews that they've done, the doors that they knocked on, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that they have searched at that point, Lake Cornelius, I believe that they have also since then searched Lake Norman as well. Lake Norman's a huge, it's lake. huge. It's so big. So, I mean, I don't know how extensive that search was obviously because it is so large. But, you know, they're not just throwing their hands up. They're doing what they can. And I guess at this point, the parents aren't talking. No. I mean, as far as we know. So on December 28th, 2022, a $200,000 bond is set for both Diana and Christopher, and they're required to surrender their passports. January 6th, 2023, a new lead comes through that moves the investigation to Madison County about three hours away from Cornelius. The tip says that during the three week gap between when Madalena was last seen and when she was reported missing, Diana drove her green Prius to Madison County near Lonesome Mountain. Apparently, she stopped in a pull off area and a random deputy who was, you know, patrolling or whatever stopped and just checked on her to see if she was okay. Now, I don't know if there was like an official record of this and that's how they figured out or if the deputy just kind of put two and two together at some point was like, oh, shit, like, yeah, I saw that lady. Yeah. Um, but either way, he says that Madalena was not in the car with her. She was alone. And but- again, they haven't given us the exact date of this, just that it was in that three week unaccounted for period. Yeah. So it begs the question, what was she doing out there? Exactly. Like I said, three hours away from home you know, on a mountain at a pull off. Yeah. Cornelius police and the state Bureau of investigation brought canines out to search that area. Police are currently asking anyone who had seen Diana, Madalena or the car between November 22nd and December 15th to contact them. February 14th investigators and a canine officer returned to the home it is later revealed that this visit and the canine officer were there because of potential drug trafficking. Drug trafficking. I know. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Aren't they out? Of, aren't they out of the house? Yeah. No. Big twist here. All right. So get ready. In early March, it is revealed that prior to Madalena's disappearance, Diana had extensive contact with a distant relative named Octavian Senanu. She allegedly asked him for help smuggling her and Madalena away from their home because of her, quote, bad relationship with Christopher. Mm. In addition to... To Octavian, Diana also had contact with several other people involved in a drug trafficking investigation. According to police, quote, persons involved with narcotics activity are also associated with human smuggling, end quote. And that is why they returned to the house of the canine officer in February. They believed that they were going to uncover drugs and money not previously found. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, like full on season of the wire over here. Right. Because from what it sounds like, these like unnamed other people, maybe even Octavian as well, were already under investigation for drug trafficking. And I think that their phones were being monitored. Mm. And when they cross referenced Diana's phone records, these two seemingly completely separate cases converged. This is so weird. I know. So what's more is that police believe that Diana may herself be involved in drug trafficking. So when that canine officer went to search her Prius, 
they alerted to the driver's side door. The drug dog. Yeah. Police say that they believe the car may hold evidence of, quote, narcotics, drug paraphernalia, and or evidence of trafficking, end quote. So, like, what the fuck? So this is now in, like, an international drug smuggling ring? Yeah, and that maybe she used these drug smugglers to smuggle her daughter somewhere? But then why not her also? Right. And so, like, all right, so this, so I have two major problems with this. One... I read, and this is unconfirmed, that among the items recovered either from the Prius um, or the house, I believe the Prius, though, was were Madalena's passports. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that does make it, you know, slightly more difficult to smuggle her out of the country. Sure. The other issue that I have with that, with all of this, is that both Diana and Christopher have been sitting in jail Since December, I mean, we're talking a full four months at this point. And like, they're not saying anything. Right. So, I mean, if it's truly like Diana smuggled Madalena to make her safe, why wouldn't she say that at this point instead of sitting for jail and likely eventually being charged with her daughter's murder? I mean, if she's involved in drug smuggling, maybe... Maybe she's more scared of those people? Yes. Yeah. That would be my guess. So then, okay. I mean, I can buy that, certainly. I'm like, Eastern European drug cartels? Sure. Sure. Like, sounds pretty scary. But what about Christopher? If he... If this is Diana's thing and he doesn't have anything to do with it and she was like trying to do this behind his back, like... Why isn't he saying anything to get himself out of jail at this point? Maybe for the same reason. Maybe he was involved with the drug smuggling and didn't know about Madalena being smuggled out of the country until, yeah, you know, she was already gone. I don't know. And then at this point, if he gives them up, it's the same thing for him. Retribution. Yeah. I, this, all, this all sounds like a movie, though. Right? I mean, as sad as it is, like I said at the beginning, this case sounded like the ones that we've heard before, right? Yeah. Harmony Montgomery, you know, and we haven't covered that case on this show, but she was in and out of foster care. She uh, was with her biological father when she disappeared. He didn't report her missing. He has now been arrested for her murder despite the fact that um, Harmony's body has yet to be found. Now, you know, I hate to say it, but like that is what this sounded like to me. Yeah, this for case, sure. Right. And Oakley Carlson, which we did cover same kind of thing. She has not been found. Her parents have yet to be charged with her murder as well, but it, it seems as though that's just a matter of time. Yeah. But with this, this whole like drug trafficking angle, I, I don't, I honestly don't know what to think anymore. <laughs> that's just, that's not something that we normally see in cases like this. And like, what I still don't understand is like, regardless of what happened, whether it was like drug trafficking, whether it was, you know, human trafficking, whether it was murder, whether it was an accident, like any, any possibility. What I don't understand is Madalena did not go to school from what we understand, on the 21st, or I'm sorry, the 22nd. Right. So why didn't they just say that all of this, the fight, the whatever happened on the 21st, like, or the 22nd even? Like, the fact that she was last seen the afternoon of the 21st, and then this whole fight, you know, and she went to bed at 10 o'clock when they were fighting story, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, that could have just been a mistake on the dates of the story that they told. Yeah. Or, and also, I mean, it should be noticed, it should be noted that the video evidence of her getting off the bus didn't come until, you know, a week or two after they gave that story and they gave those dates. Right. So at the time when they were telling the story, they didn't know there was video evidence of her being on the bus on the 21st and not on the 22nd and not on the 23rd. But I mean, there would still be school records of her either being there or not being there. Right. But maybe they didn't 
exactly remember. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. Man. Like, I'm bad with dates, but like, damn. I mean, if I'm trying to cover up either some crazy drug trafficking ring or like a murder, I feel like I would look at a fucking calendar before I start talking to police. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, clearly these these people are not, you know, the smartest. Yeah. It's just so weird because especially like... Like, Christopher just seems like a normal dude. Like, he's a mechanical designer. Like, you know, he just, like, had a be bopping normal life. Like, he has no criminal record. It doesn't seem like he's ever been involved in anything shady. And then all of a sudden, whatever. I don't even know what's happening here, but it's not good. There's a 12-year-old girl missing. And he's he's in the middle of it one way or another. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. And But, yeah, so it, it still gets weirder, though. When I'm talking about all of this coming out, this whole like drug trafficking angle, whatever, this all came out in March of 2023, like AKA a month ago. Oh. Yeah. Wow. And just about a week ago, so like a week before we are sitting here recording this, Diana Kojikari was slapped with new charges. And this is wild to me. Felony possession of a controlled substance while in jail. Oh, she had drugs on her. Yes, but she's been in jail since December. Well, obviously she didn't she didn't smuggle them into the prison, but they found drugs in her cell. Well, on you know, on, on her on her person in yeah. her shirt pocket. So on March seventeenth, they you know I don't know if they suspected something they or if it was just a normal search. I don't know how that works, but regardless. March 17th, they apparently patted her down and found a baggie of white powder in her shirt pocket. So they tested it and found that it was a cocaine and fentanyl based product. Mm, Nice. She says she found it by the showers. (laughs) Those aren't my pants. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great defense. Love it. Yeah. I don't know what to think about that. I mean... With all this drug trafficking stuff, and then she has like cocaine and fentanyl in March, Mm -hmm. three months after she goes to jail. Yeah, maybe she wasn't as clean and normal, quote unquote, as we thought. So, I mean, this case is just 10 times weirder than I thought. You know, I, I knew it was weird when we first heard about it, because when we first heard about it in December... You know, we knew that she had already been missing for three weeks and her parents hadn't reported her missing. So we already knew something bad was going on. But like all of this with the drug trafficking and the Eastern Europeans and like. How did how did we come about having finding out the story of Madalena potentially being trafficked out of the country? So I think that came from these from this drug investigation from like wiretaps. Okay. And or if it wasn't wiretaps, after they went through Diana's phone records, they found Octavian and it sounds like they interviewed him and he said, Oh yeah, she was trying to get me to like smuggle her and Madeline out of the country. So he said that. From what I understand, it was either he said that to police or they had it on tape, one of the two, or both. Cause I'm I'm curious as to whether <laughs> Maybe potentially this Eastern European drug cartel took took Madalena. Yeah. And that's why they didn't report her missing and took her for whatever reason related to the drug smuggling, you know, holding her hostage or whatever so that these two would do whatever they needed to do or whatever. Right. But, you know, you got to If that's the case, like, obviously, Diana and Christopher aren't doing anything. Because they've been sitting in jail for four months. Well, that probably wasn't the original. Well, no, I know. But I mean, my point is, is that like, so what are they going to do now? I don't know. What's the next move? You know, I don't know. I didn't write this terrible movie. (sighs) I know. Like (laughs) this, this is a plot to a bad movie. Yeah. But within it is this poor little girl. Yeah. Who is just going to school and living her life and eating ice cream and like doing all the things that a kid her age does and whatever happened to her. I mean, she got swept into something that was not her fault. And 
is suffering the consequences of, you know, the actions of the adults around her who were supposed to be protecting her. So what happened to Madalena? Like, is she still out there alive somewhere? Could she be safe and hidden in Moldova or even still here in the States somewhere? Did her mother kill her? Did her stepfather? Were they both involved somehow? Unfortunately, this case leaves us with way more questions than it does answers. On April 11th of 2023, Cornelius Police Department held an event to commemorate Madalena's 12th birthday. They have not given up on searching for the little girl. One way or another, it seems as though her mother and or stepfather caused her disappearance. And given that they remain in custody, I mean, I do feel confident that this case isn't going to remain unsolved. I think something's going to break, you know? Yeah, I mean, one way or another, obviously, they're on to something bigger than what they originally thought it was. But the fact that they have evidence of of these things and... And evidence enough to release it to the public. Right. That shows you that they're on to something. Mm -hmm. So I would agree. I think that we're going to get answers to this case, but who knows what the fuck the answers are going to be. Well, yeah. And there's certainly more information to be found. Right. And that's why it's really important for anybody who saw Diana, who saw Christopher, um, you know, anywhere between North Carolina and Michigan um, in that three week period from like, they'll say the 23rd, I'll say the 21st and December 15th when Madalena was reported missing. I mean, anybody who encountered them, whether it was at the grocery store, or a parking lot, you know, whatever needs to come forward because their movements. And I'm sure that there are, there is a lot more information about their movement movements based on their cell phone data, cell phone data and potentially easy pass records or exactly road records of some sort. Like, right. All of that. Yeah. I mean, the police I'm sure have verified that given that he told that story that he went to Michigan. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure that there is, but still, I mean, we still need any person who can, you know, give any other insight to come forward. So that's the big reason why I wanted to cover this because I feel like even though it's obviously a huge story in the Cornelius area and, and, you know, North Carolina in general, I don't think it's gotten a huge reach beyond that. So I just want to try to get it out there a little bit more because Madalena could still be alive out there. Like we honestly, I, I feel like anything's possible at this point. Take a look um, at our social media at our website. We're going to post uh, the, you know, the picture of the car, the Prius, you know, of Diana, like all that information. We'll post pictures of Madalena, of course, so that anybody, you know, who may have seen something can contact the proper authorities. There are still people out there who may have seen something or who know something, and we need them to speak up because we need to find Madalena. Madalena Kojikari has been missing from Cornelius, North Carolina, since around November 21st, 2022. She's a white female with brown hair weighing approximately 90 pounds. She was last seen wearing jeans, pink and purple and white Adidas shoes, and a white t-shirt and jacket. Anyone with information about Madalena is asked to call the Cornelius Police Department at 704 892 7773 or the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. 
and then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And then they were gone is a little monster production. Hey, you can do it!